Guy Benson from townhall.com to come up here. He and I are the Fox News contributor. He is, uh, he, he writes at Town Hall, now a sister side of Red State, and we're going to let him preview the coming Senate elections, and then we're going to sit down and have a conversation. Uh, he even, like, whiteboarded things out on a giant notepad for you people to look at. I guess the camera angle will be able to show you on the monitors if you're not sitting right down center. And I'm going to run down and, and get a mic on, and we're going to sit in the chair and have a conversation. Sure, if this sucker's on yet. Um, so I was at this is my first Red State gathering, and so it's really exciting to be here. And sometimes Eric gives me some good-natured ribbing about being sort of a squishy rhino sellout. And so I'm not even kidding. Before things got rolling here during the, the planning stages for Red State gathering, I actually offered to sit in a dunk tank and do like a rhino dunk tank, where you guys could spend a dollar or something to try to dunk me. And I would shout things like, Boehner McConnell 16, or, you know, uh, you know, and you, yeah, you'd dunk me, I'd get back up there, and I'd say, do blink. And he'd dunk me, and Chris Christie, great or the greatest? And he'd dunk me. Um, and so I thought that'd be fun, so maybe next year. We can do that. I'm throwing. I would. I, I would come in my very finest Beltway cocktail party attire, and uh, you guys could have some fun at my expense. What I thought I'd do today, and I was very happy to be invited, was to run through the landscape of the 2014 elections, primarily focusing on the Senate, because we'll get a little bit of the House stuff and some of the governor races. But I think conservatives' eyes need to be on the Senate prize, and we've heard that throughout the weekend, and understandably so. So I've broken it down into a number of tiers. And let's see, is, this is, oh, OK, good. Um, and I want to start at the very beginning with tier one. There are five states mentioned in my tier one piece here, three of which these seats are open seats, currently controlled by the Democrats. And then these two down here, Georgia, Kentucky, as you know, are currently Republican-held seats. Unless all five of these seats are red on election night, I think any hope of winning back the Senate isn't going to happen. You need to sweep, Republicans need to sweep all five of these. So let's go through them quickly. In Montana, this has become a very interesting race all of a sudden, not because the Democrats are getting any more competitive, but because the quasi-incumbent who was replacing Max Baucus, who was sent off to China to be ambassador, uh, John Walsh, has dropped out of the race because he is a plagiarist. And so he's gone. The Democrats are trying to figure out who they're going to put in there to replace him at the last minute here. Brian Schweitzer, who's the former governor, who was rumored to be thinking about the seat earlier in the cycle, who had declined, he confirmed, no, he's not going to run. Um, he most recently made headlines by baselessly speculating about Eric Cantor's sexuality, uh, which was super classy of him. Um, so he won't be running. Uh, the Democrats don't know who their candidate's going to be. The, the, the people that we hear about are both basically unknowns. One is a progressive activist and professor. The other is an abortion rights activist. Uh, I don't think either one of them stands a chance against Steve Daines. So I think that that should be a, an easy Republican win. South Dakota, open seat. Senator Johnson's retiring. You've got the popular former governor, Mike Rounds, is the Republican candidate against Rick Wyland. Double-digit lead for Rounds should be safe as well. This is all barring disaster. And I don't put disaster past Republicans ever. But <laughs> barring disaster, these should be easy. West Virginia, uh, also a double-digit lead for Republicans. It's going to be a female senator, Shelley Moore Capito. She's a member of the House right now. She's running against a woman named Natalie Tennant, who had a bad week. Uh, one of her staffers was asked about what Ms. Tennant thinks about President Obama's policies, and the staffer, the aide, said, well, she agrees with most, most all of it, uh, which is not the right answer in West Virginia. <laughs> let, let, me, uh, let me tell you how, how bad that answer is in, in West Virginia. In the Democratic primary of 2012, in the presidential race, Barack Obama only won 60 percent 
of the Democratic primary in 2012, he lost 40% of the vote to inmate 11593-051, who was serving a term, a felony term, in federal prison here in Texas. That person won 40% of the vote in the Democratic primary against Barack Obama. So that should be a win. <laughs> All right, Georgia and Kentucky. Eric can, can tell you everything you need to know about the Georgia race. Uh, long Republican primary. Businessman uh, David Perdue has emerged as the candidate. Michelle Nunn, daughter with a you know, famous last name, is running. She also has had a rough go recently with that campaign memo leaking, where her own campaign described her as a lightweight, not an authentic Georgian, too liberal. Uh, these are their words. They also said she might have a problem with the organization that she ran having funded terrorists. Uh, this was their own memo about her. Uh, and they did. They funneled money to Hamas, which is in the news recently, if you've heard about them. Um, so that could be, uh, funding Hamas could be a problem in a Senate race. Uh, especially in a state like Georgia. So, and, and my favorite part about that memo was they made it very clear that they really wanted to get lots of money from Jewish donors. And then, th th that's what they said. And then they said, uh, policy on Israel, TBD. So they're going to figure out what, what she thinks of Israel when it became necessary to get that big money from Jewish donors. So that's um, not Senator Nunn. Uh, although it's actually a relatively close race. It's a modest Republican lead, should be a hold, but you never know. Kentucky, we've got another female candidate running against Mitch McConnell, another woman with a famous last name. Uh, it's hard to actually overstate how terrible Alison Lundergan Grimes is. Uh, she is a hardcore lefty. She's quasi running as a moderate, but she has been endorsed by all the abortion groups. She says that she would have voted against bans on sixth month abortion and beyond. She's way out of step with most American voters, especially in Kentucky. She's got Elizabeth Warren coming down there to campaign for her. So, I mean, that's, that's the candidate who is slightly trailing Mitch McConnell right now. Um, so it's, it's a close race. I think McConnell is still favored. Uh, over time, and they are tying her every single day to Barack Obama, who has an approval rating in the 20s in that state. She won't say if she would have voted for Obamacare, so we know what that means. Of course she would have. She would vote for Harry Reid. Um, she also flashed her foreign policy prowess this week by, or I guess it was last week, talking about how Israel's Iron Dome missile defense shield has helped block the tunnels. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's unique. <laughs> you need all five of these to be read, and I think they will be. So Republicans need six seats net total to take back the Senate. If, those, if that last page goes according to plan, they are at that point at plus three. So you need to find three more. My second tier of states is Alaska, Arkansas, Louisiana, North Carolina. Um, these are all states carried by Mitt Romney in 2012. Um, Mark, and these are all uh, incumbents, Democratic incumbents. Mark Begich, Mark Pryor, Mary Landrew, Kay Hagan. Um, Mark Begich is still awaiting his Republican opponent. They don't have their primary till August the 19th. Uh, the front runner is a guy named Dan Sullivan, um, who was uh, a soldier who fought overseas. He was in Iraq. Uh, the Democrats have been attacking him for not being in Alaska enough, and he was like, well, I was fighting for the country. Um, in Arkansas, you've got Mark Pryor, who's uh, got a, a great last name and a great legacy in the state uh, when it comes to his, his, family's, uh, his family's reputation. He very curiously attacked his Republican opponent, who's also uh, a veteran, for saying that he ha feels like he has a sense of entitlement because he served in the military which is an odd attack coming from a guy who's a senator because his father is famous in the state. That's just sort of really backward. So Tom Cotton is the Republican uh, conservative from the House. He's now leading in most polls, but there have been a number of weird polls that'll pro crop up every so often showing prior ahead big. So you, you see like, you know, 
uh, cotton's up by five or six or seven points, and then here's a poll that shows prior up by nine or something strange like that. So keep an eye on Arkansas. Louisiana, um, Mary Landrieu, uh, these were all deciding votes for Obamacare, right? Every single person was the deciding vote for Obamacare uh, who's, who's running on this page. Uh, Mary Landrieu, during the Obamacare debate, called it a pathetic lie that costs would go up under Obamacare. She also said that she would be 100% responsible for the results of Obamacare. So I think the people of Louisiana ought to make that happen for her. Um, they've got a weird sort of jungle primary system in Louisiana. So it's, it's the top two. And if no one gets to 50, you go to a, a runoff in December. It is completely possible that Republicans would have netted five Senate seats and would need one more. And it would come down to Louisiana in de December. That could absolutely happen. There are two Republicans in the race. Bill Cassidy is a member of Congress. He's a doctor. He's provided uh, health care to uninsured people for years. He helped after Katrina setting up clinics and stuff to help people who had been washed away uh, and their families get, get their health care back together. He's the front runner. He's leading heavily. But there's also Colonel Rob Mass uh, Man uh, Manis, excuse me, uh, who is his more conservative sort of challenger. They'll all go. They'll all vote and then the top two vote getters will move on to the runoff if no one gets to 50%, which I think is very likely that that will be the uh, scenario. Kay Hagan uh, is running against Tom Tillis, who is the Speaker of the House down in North Carolina. She had had a pretty um, consistent but small lead over Tillis in the polls. There have been a few polls in the last couple weeks that have shown, even the last few days, that have shown Tillis inching ahead of her. Uh, they're starting to use an attack against her that I think is, is well-deserved. When she ran and won six years ago, she unseated Elizabeth Dole. And what she kept saying over and over again was, Senator Dole votes with President Bush 92% of the time. And that is unacceptable. We are more independent of that in the state of North, uh, North Carolina. We can't have a senator who votes with the president 92% of the time like Senator Dole. Well, uh, Senator Hagan votes with President Obama 96% of the time. So turnabout is fair play. Before I flip the page, if Republicans sweep these four races, not only have they won the Senate, it's probably a wave type year, uh, and they've got seats to spare. If they take three of these four races, they've won the Senate. Anything else also would be gravy. If they split 50 50, let's, let's say they knock off, let's say they get Pryor and Landrew, but they don't get the other two or something like that. Then they need to find one more seat somewhere else. Which brings us to tier three, Iowa and Colorado and Michigan. And I've listed these in the order that I think are most likely for Republicans to win. Iowa's an open seat. Senator Harkin is retiring. Um, on the Democratic side, they've got this train wreck of a candidate, Bruce Braley, who is a member of Congress. Uh, he is a man of the people. And let me explain what I mean by that. He famously complained about the lack of towel service at the congressional gym during the shutdown. He sued, he's a lawyer, he sued his neighbor over some stray chickens that got into his yard. Sued his neighbor. Uh, he also went to an out-of-state fundraiser with a bunch of fellow trial lawyers and bashed farmers, which is maybe not the best idea if you're running in Iowa. Um, and also demeaned Senator Grassley, um, who has an approval rating in Iowa of like 68%. Um, and he was saying if, if the Republicans win the Senate, Chuck Grassley, a farmer from Iowa who's not even a lawyer, would be in charge of the Senate Judiciary Committee. I know. Heaven forbid. Uh, by the way, you know who's second in line on the Democrat side to be chairman is Dianne Feinstein, who's not a lawyer. I wonder if he has a problem with that. Anyway, he's, he's had some big missteps. Um, when, the, when the farmer thing blew up, they put this thing on Facebook, no, we love farmers. They used a picture of a farm that turned out to be from England. Uh, it's, just been, it's just been a series of mistakes. And on the conservative side of the aisle is this wonderful woman, Joni Ernst, who's a mother. She's a soldier who actually had to leave the campaign trail for two weeks to do her National Guard training. Um, and a bunch of Republican surrogates came into the state to campaign on her behalf while she was gone. 
Um, it was something like Serving for Joni, something like that. Um, she made her name in the primary with some attention-grabbing advertisements uh, about castrating pigs and hogs and all sorts of things that, as a Northeastern rhino, I just, I can't even, I can't even. But, uh, <laughs> interesting fact, if Joni Ernst wins, and the polling now has shown her for the last maybe three or four weeks with a slight lead in that race, if she wins, she will be the first ever female elected to any congressional or senate seat from the state of Iowa. They have never had a statewide female leader, governor, senator, or a member of Congress. Um, of course, yeah, war on women, right? <laughs> Thanks, Iowa. Colorado, um, this is an incumbent race. Mark Udall, uh, who has, this is, Colorado is a purple state. Mark Udall has voted with President Obama 99% of the time. He is the ultimate rubber stamp. Um, the Republicans have actually gotten and, and nominated uh, and recruited an excellent candidate, Congressman Cory Gardner, who really has brought the entire center-right coalition together in Colorado. Uh, they are going hardcore against him with the war on women stuff. Uh, he's pushing back with Obamacare and energy issues. Um, polling shows this race a dead heat. Maybe a slight, slight lead for Udall at the moment, the Democrat, but it's going to be very close. Gardner is an excellent candidate. If Cory Gardner in the 2014 election cycle cannot defeat a guy like Udall, uh, that's, that's a red flag for the future of that state. Michigan. Um, this is a blue state in presidential years. You've got Governor Rick Snyder there who sa uh, signed into law the right to work legislation. He appears to be relatively cruising, um, which is interesting. On the Senate side, you've got a congressman, Gary Peters. Um, he's, he's a Democrat. He's running against Terry Lynn Land. Uh, she was Secretary of State in Michigan for a couple terms. She had been floundering pretty badly, frankly, um, and was down seven, eight points in a lot of the polling. She started to make a little bit of a comeback, and there have been two polls in the last two days that show her down one. Uh, this is going to be a close race, probably, and we'll see if Snyder, if he can build enough coattails, maybe uh, she'll be able to pull it off. She's, she's raising a lot of money, which is good news. So, again, if you need one or more of these seats to get to that six-plus number, I think Iowa's the most likely, Colorado next, Michigan's still a little bit of a stretch, but uh, within distance. And finally, Tier 4, New Hampshire and Oregon. Um, Scott Brown is running against the incumbent Jean Shaheen in New Hampshire. Um, she has a pretty sizable lead in most polling, but when you talk to people in New Hampshire and who've watched the state for a long time, these types of races often break very late. And that's actually how Jean Shaheen won her most recent race, where she was down, made a surge, won. Uh, and Scott Brown is a, a very good retail politician. He's, he's got that pickup truck going again, and he's going around the state. And right now, I would not bet on him to win, but I wouldn't put it past him either. Um, New Hampshire has been especially hard hit by Obamacare. And Gene Shaheen repeated the you can keep it lie over and over again. So we'll see if, if she pays a price for that. And then you've got Oregon, Jeff Merkley, just a boring do-nothing uh, senator, basically. It's a very blue state. Obamacare has been a complete nightmare in that state. Uh, they wasted $300 million on an exchange that signed up zero people online and had to scrap it. Uh, he is. Nevertheless, leading fairly comfortably over uh, a pediatric neurosurgeon, a female, moderate, um, named Monica Webby. Some polls have shown her within striking distance, not at the moment, it looks like, but she's a quality candidate, so I just want to keep an eye on that. Longer shots, Minnesota, Al Franken, um, Virginia, uh, Mark Warner, and New Jersey, actually, where Cory Booker is not really as strong as I'm sure the Democrats would like him to be looking at the moment. So that's the Senate picture. If I had to put my money down, I think the Republicans probably win six or seven seats and take back the Senate. It is not a sure bet. There is a lot of overconfidence on the conservative side about winning back the Senate. We need a big, big turnout on our side. It's going to come down to turnout, and we have to make that happen. All right. Very quickly here, House of Representatives and Governors, um, Republicans are going to keep the House. There's 
basically no question about that. The NRCC is talking about their drive to 245, which would require netting uh, a gain of 11 seats. Uh, I think that's a bit ambitious. Most polling and projections I've seen put it in maybe five to eight seat gain range for the GOP, but I think it is a pretty good bet that Republicans will expand uh, their House majority in November, and so Speaker Pelosi 2.0 is not gonna happen. And finally, yeah, that's worth clapping for. <laughs> Quickly with the governor races, very interesting. Republicans have 29 governorships right now, which is ex pretty extraordinary. Um, there are two seats on both sides of the aisle that I think are likely to change hands. So I think Democrats look like they've got Governor Corbett on the ropes in Pennsylvania, Governor LePage uh, in Maine as well. Neither one is over, but those look like decent Democratic pickups in those races. Republicans are very heavily favored to finally win in Illinois, uh, where Pat Quinn is just, he's the least popular governor in America. He's so bad. Um, and the Republicans have nominated a guy named uh, Rahner, Bruce Rahner, I think. Um, and so he's favored to win. And also Arkansas looks like that's going to flip as well for the GOP. Three absolute toss-ups in Connecticut, Florida, and Kansas. Governor Brownback's having a little trouble in Kansas. Um, last poll I saw out of Florida had Rick Scott ahead by two points over, in my opinion, the worst politician in America, Charlie Crist. Yeah. I don't know what I'll do if Charlie Chris somehow wins again. It's just, it's just, it can't happen. Please, Florida. Um, and then there's a few other interesting uh, governor races that we can maybe get into, but I think that this picture here, Republicans having 27, 28, 29, at best 30 governorships is probably what we're looking at. So no big changes in the House or governor picture. Hopefully significant changes on the Senate side. And with that, I'm gonna sit down with Eric and we'll chat. Now, first of all, let me explain to you somewhat uniquely, Guy is actually helping me kick off a format that many of you through your evaluation forms in the last couple of years requested, and that is uh, a conversation style uh, setup up here. And I've been wanting to do them for a while as well, so I appreciate Guy doing this. I want to go back to the Senate and jump ahead and into the next cycle. I, I, I get the sense from talking to a lot of Republicans, I, I get as a conservative, I, I'm angry with a lot of things that have happened in this primary cycle, and I hear from conservatives, they don't want to go out in November now. They, they want to punish the people they feel attack conservatives and whatnot, and, but then let's discuss the Senate cycle in 2016. Yeah, a more so the, the, these are arguments that I've heard. Does it really matter if the Republicans win the Senate in 2014? Because Obama still be president, um, you know, is this something that Republicans or the conservative base ought to really make a priority? I would argue yes, for a couple of reasons, one of which has to do with what Eric has alluded to. In 2016, that's when all the 2010 people are up again. 2010 was a great year for the GOP, so, and it was not a presidential year. So there are gonna be some people that are gonna be on, on the Republican side that are gonna be pretty vulnerable next time around. The map, so to speak, has shifted very much in our direction this cycle. It will be shifted back in the other direction with more pickup opportunities for the Dems in 2016. So if J the Republicans don't win the Senate this cycle, it is, it is not happening next cycle. There's a good chance they'd lose it back in 2016. So I think it's important for that reason. I also think it's important um, just on principle. Uh, Harry Reid is a disgrace. Harry Reid is a disgrace. He, he has been a terrible leader. He has been a bad person, saying terrible, baseless things, and he deserves to be ousted. Okay, let, let me ask you about this. There are, a, there are a number of people, and I've talked to Democrats in Washington, who scratch their heads about the things that Harry Reid says. And you know, I, I've, I've kind of been of the opinion for a while now that the, the working strategy of Democrats is to just make mm, up. Uh, but Harry Reid says some really just off the wall, mm, break with reality things. He um, does. I, I, I mean, if, if you can be, 
if you're a boxer and you suffer all these concussions over time, Harry Reid was a boxer, and I'm starting to wonder if some conservatives are wondering, there might be something going on there. Well, he, I'll, I'll say this about Harry Reid, and, and by the way, one other thing about winning the Senate, you'll recall that Harry Reid nuked the filibuster, right, for judges, and so there will probably be another major vacancy in the next couple of years, and Republicans controlling the Judiciary Committee is so important. It's so yeah. important. Yes, Scalia isn't getting any younger. No. Neither is Thomas. No, exactly. One, one final note on Harry Reid, looking ahead to 2016. He is very nervous because the governor of Nevada, Brian Sandoval, has an approval rating that is astronomically high. Uh, Hispanic, uh, very popular governor of that state. And the rumor is he is planning to challenge Harry Reid. And Harry Reid barely squeaked by Sharon Angle, who is unknown, basically. Brian Sandoval is very well known, very popular in that state. And he would be, I think, a, a very good, would present a very good opportunity to actually beat Harry Reid and really retire him in two years. So uh, we'll see. Now, you know, the, the, the last name Barber isn't popular among conservatives right now, but, but to Haley Barber's credit, he developed what you can call a rule back when he was the RNC chairman that they call the Barber Rule. To win Senate seats, you must win gubernatorial seats mm -hmm. because gubernatorial campaigns help lay a state framework for seats. And I think a lot of the national reporters miss, like, for example, in Georgia or, or in Texas with Wendy Davis, the Democratic parties in these states don't have the apparatus to run statewide campaigns. And a lot of the reason they're pushing people like Nunn and Carter and Georgia or Davis here isn't for them to actually win, but to begin to build the ground game for 2016. Yeah, well, I mean, the governor races are, are important on a number of levels. Uh, you mentioned Wendy Davis. She has just released a new ad that's basically accusing Greg Abbott of being soft on rape. It's this terrible ad. And uh, she uses the case of a woman who was raped. And the Houston Chronicle reported this morning that it turns out the Davis campaign did not ask the permission of the rape victim to use her story. War on women. Extremely, extremely sleazy. Uh, Wendy Davis is going to lose. The question is by how much. And uh, I think that she's setting herself up for, for a double digit. OK, I, I'm going to ask you this. And I don't mean to put you on the spot. And this uh -oh. is one of those unscripted questions. Rasmussen seems to have overcorrected its polling after being embarrassed in 2012. And I noticed that the left is, is just galvanized towards a Rasmussen poll that shows Davis only a few points behind, so is other Democrats ahead. And none of the latest Rasmussen polls comport to any of the polls that called 2012 right. And I'm just, I'm wondering if they've overcompensated. Uh, I have been very, I, I've gotten to know Scott Rasmussen, who's left Rasmussen, by the way, polling. Um, he, he's a nice guy. I will just say I have taken Rasmussen polling with a grain of salt for a long time. Uh, there's a reason why conservatives used to wave it around as outlier polls. There's a reason why liberals are now waving those around as outlier polls. Um, most of the polling we've seen in Texas shows uh, Abbott cruising. Uh, whether he's up by nine or 17. No pun intended one there with cruising. Thing, we'll see, yeah. yes. I, no, no pun <laughs> we got to be careful these days. I wanted to just mention a couple other governor's races that I think are, are interesting and important. Wisconsin. Scott Walker is in a dogfight again. People assumed he was going to sort of waltz since he's already beaten them twice. The reporting about this phony scandal against him has been perhaps the most irresponsible reporting I've ever seen. There was this- It's not irresponsible, it's intentional. It was inten yeah, intentionally <laughs> uh, negligent mm -hmm. journalism, where there was this investigation by partisan prosecutors into conservatives in Wisconsin. Walker was not a target of the investigation. He was never even subpoenaed the investigation. The investigation was such a fraud, it was thrown out of court in state court and federal court, with the judges saying, if you resume this investigation, we will hold you, prosecutors, in contempt of court. And there's a, a lawsuit against the prosecutors pending. They released some of the documents as it pertains to the countersuit against the prosecutors about evidence that they had failed to present, or they had presented and failed in court months earlier. And the media reported on those allegations like they were new bombshells, when in fact they were rejected legal arguments of months earlier, and, and they right. tried to tie Walker to that. So he is tied 
Um, I think he's definitely still favored, but you know he's in he's in for a bumpy ride. It's going to be another nail biter, I think, in Wisconsin. There's also something very interesting happening in Ohio, where Governor Kasich. Uh, looks like he was going to be safe anyway, had a pretty modest but substantial lead in most of the polling. And then we have an, an August surprise, I guess, against his Democratic opponent, Ed Fitzgerald. Uh, turns out Mr. Fitzgerald was stopped by police a while back uh, at 4.30 in the morning in a, an abandoned parking lot with a woman uh, who wasn't his wife. And he has been unable to explain what he was doing in a car at 4.30 in the morning <laughs> with a woman who's not his wife. And in order to deflect from those questions, he has put out a Facebook statement about his son's illness that he had dealt with a few years earlier, uh, which is sort of a shabby move. Uh, so I think Kasich is looking uh, pretty strong there, and, and Fitzgerald seems to be imploding. I want to see if there's any other ones on that list. Oh, uh, just. New Mexico and Nevada. I mentioned Brian Sandoval, who's very popular. He's right. going to win. Uh, Susana Martinez has had approval ratings in the 60 to 65 percent range for most of her term. Uh, they're not going to, I think, have a, a really strong challenge against her at all. Uh, she's been a highly popular and successful governor there. So I think we're going to see her for a second term as well. All right. Folks, Guy Benson, a good election Thank for you. Thank so you so much. We gotta go take your lav off yeah. and give it to Ryan. Sounds good. Bye, guys.